Bien, muchas gracias. Eh, comenzamos entonces. Eh, buenas tardes. Bienvenido. So, good afternoon. Welcome. This is the panel on uh, privacy in uh, DNS that we organize in LACNIC. As you know, DNS, the domain name system, is one of the essential things for the operations of Internet. But at the same time, it concentrates a lot of information on the users and the networks. So that makes it highly transparent. So when browsing, when the users browse, that is too transparent and that may have privacy implications. Uh, Nico said he's an expert on security and he says users are stupidly honest when we uh, send queries to the searchers, search engines. So after the search engines, a much of what do we do in the internet is kept in the DNS. So all of these blocks have been produced, DNS uh, on the internet to provide privacy in browsing. However, not everything is uh, so perfect. The privacy mechanisms that have been designed have both pros and cons, and that's why we have this panel with uh, outstanding speakers that will give us their feedback and we thank them for having participated uh, for having accepted to participate in this exercise first of all uh christine hooper's general manager of sec vr julio salgado um invest research r d and nick chile nicolas antonello regional technical engagement uh, manager and carlos martinez cto of lacnic and chairing this uh uh session i leave you with miguel ignacio estrada our strategic relations manager at LACNIC. thank you oscar thank you for welcoming me i will i welcome you all and thank you for participating as oscar just said the dns this uh hierarchy name uh names system that enables us uh, users to translate the ip addresses into recognizable uh, things the uh, queries are transmitted um, in plain text and they could uh, leave um, to open uh, private uh, uh, aspects of uh, the user's life there are some standards including dns over tls dot or dns uh, over uh https doh and other standards that through encryption uh try to enhance the security and the privacy what we intend to do in this webinar is to analyze the characteristics of these proposals the pros and cons of each to see what uh is the state of the art, uh, how things are going, and discuss what we think is better and what we don't like so much. So let's start with a question for Christine, Christine Hoopers. Christine, the DNS queries are transmitted, as we said, in plain text, and they may reveal not just the, webs the website that uh, a user visits, but also data about uh, the services provided in certain domains. Do you consider that this is risky for the final user? And if so, why do you consider it? Good afternoon, everybody. It's a, it's a great honor to be here at uh, in this webinar. This is a topic that we always discuss risk. We have to think a lot what type of risk and uh, what uh, what the risk is like. I think that in the case of DNS queries, the risk depends on several factors. I, I use, uh, where am I? Am I at home? I am at a coffee shop, a cafeteria, at a conference, at a hotel in another country. Who is my access provider? Who is allowing me, enabling me, me to uh, browse in the internet? So all of this um, leads to the question, who do I trust more? And what kind of information am I sending to those that are giving me access? Because I think that something that we have to consider is that 
there's always somebody in the internet that will know what I'm searching and where I want to reach and will have to answer me. So I think that there are decisions that sometimes may be taken by the user. Other times it's not a decision the user makes, but uh, and there are some technologies that are offered to the users, but without uh, the user being aware of that uh, uh, potential solution uh, to uh, privacy. And sometimes it's uh, through a mail exchange, they they tell me, for instance, that I'm trying to send an email to a certain institution. Sometimes the things are not uh, as simple as uh, the everyday examples, for instance. Uh, it's a query for a medical um, uh, question. Um, should uh, or uh, the DNS uh, registries that are not so well known. Uh, maybe I wanted to see the fingerprints of some server. May, and that will enable me to see what kind of relationship I have with the network on the other side that may be or not a sensitive problem for the user. I think that in the end, there are other more subtle uh, aspects, such as the very fact of using a device and that the device is using the standard setup uh, configuration or by default. So if I'm using a device uh, that takes a pool of DSTP or may, there may be different depending on whether I'm using Apple or Android or whether I'm in a certain country because in my system I have a certain DNS. But I think that it's a risk that is also happens at the other end. If we start focusing uh, or concentrating some uh, services implemented in a way where there are actors that have ex access to queries uh, excessively, that would represent another risk for the user. And I think that the most important thing in this discussion as to I chose a perfect privacy or not is to let the user choose to see what privacy the user wants, what is more important for the user, because some some people, rather than protecting the query, want to make sure that, they, that the answer comes from the resolver that uh, is trying to get in touch with. So that would be more important than privacy or any other technology that wants to give uh, privacy should also give integrity. It should um, so that nobody um, uh, to make sure that nobody made any changes. So in the end, this discussion is it's important to know who the resolver is. Most protocols that try to solve the privacy issues, except the queue names, uh, which is not necessarily a new protocol, is with an internet manager conference document that is says that is uh, protected from uh, recursive. That is, it's protecting from my browser. So the debate is that, well, everything that I do is from my browser, but it is not. We have internet that is much more than my browser. And when I access a site uh, and being able to choose who the recursive is, is very important. And there I need to trust because the protocol, as a matter of fact, is protecting my conversation until it gets to the end. And this is not a minor issue because many attacks occur midway. It's somebody that is managing to enter the, the room where I am or having access to what I'm having access. But the queries have a certain risk. However, we must think of uh, that we have to whether the solutions are going to bring about other problems and whether those problems are worse or better than uh, the existing ones and uh, for that purpose we need to know what uh, is important for the user because the risk may increase or be reduced depending on the understanding of the person that's using this technology and, and uh, awareness of what is at risk so what well, it's important to know what kind of technology i'd like to have to minimize a uh, risk that i'm not even aware of so as all the answer is it depends and indeed, there are some DNS risks, but I think that all the technology that is uh, uh, coming has its uh, um, problems with resilience. We start uh, putting the queries in one single uh, place and 
that will lead to other problems. But that is just an initial comment on this risk issue. I think that there's always a risk and we always have to weigh the risk for each depending on where they are, what they're doing in the internet, what data they're trying to obtain. Thank you. That was very interesting. Yes. Uh, uh, so it's not just technology that matters, but also what the person, the person should know who they are trusting. I have a question for everyone. We know that there are many protocols, some are being developed, and I would like to ask everyone, is there any one you prefer? And if so, which would that be and why? So let us start with Nico so that Christine doesn't have to speak so much. And then Nico. Hi. Good morning, good evening, good afternoon, depending on where you are. So this is a tricky question. My answer would be, uh, there's none I prefer, but I can tell you why I don't prefer one over the other. This is like Christine was saying today. I always view privacy as something that is not very objective. It is quite subjective. This will depend on what one will prioritize. Privacy for me is not the same as what privacy is for all the other members of the panel, even though we do share some knowledge or use of the internet. So privacy will not be perceived equally by each one of us. So what will I prioritize? Well, this will somehow define what characteristics or what protocols I would like to operate with in order to strengthen what I prioritize. Now, why don't I ha have a favorite one? Well, in general, all these protocols, or at least the ones that were mentioned so far, or those that Nacho was referring to, they don't all act on the same place. It's not one or the other. Maybe except for DOH or DOT, well, in that case, it would be one or the other. But nevertheless, we are speaking of the same type of service, but the different protocols we were speaking of operate in different sections of the DNS ecosystem. So they supplement one another. So that would be my initial comment and answers. That's why I don't have a favorite one. And then once again, it will depend on what I prioritize which I would like to have and which not. And then from a technical point of view, there are some that, well, this is where our personal subjectivist steps in. But like Christine was saying, if what we wish to have is not to concentrate and wish to have distributed internet, for example, domain names uh, which are distributed, both in terms of the authoritative ones or the recursive ones, so those protocols that somehow or other tend, not because of the protocol itself, but because of the implementation, we have to separate protocol from implementation. There are some protocols that tend to some kind of concentration. So in my, my case, they would be less preferred compared to those that might tend to diversify. Thank you, Nico. Interesting answer and the issue of subjectivity in the search for privacy. Hugo. Any favorite protocol? We cannot hear you, Hugo. Yes, now we can hear you more than a preferred one. I have one that I would, I would never use if we speak about favorite ones. 
Well, if we go focus on the technical aspects, clearly the DOT protocol is the one I would recommend using now, DNS over TLS, but the future solution is that the DOQ is not yet ready, but they are at the initial testing stages. But if we could have a recipe, DOT now and DOQ in the future. Genes over HTTPS has a series of problems, starting from the fact that if we speak more purely, this is not a transport protocol. And then there are certain implementations that cause problems. And the definition of the DOH protocol has, has enormous chapter, one of the longest chapters I have ever read in an IETF RFC, speaking about privacy issues that might arise. So a protocol that attempts to improve privacy might lead to many more problems than what you're trying to solve. So more than having a favorite one, I think that DOH should be avoided. That would be it. Thank you, Hugo. Carlos. I will play your game, Nacho, and I will choose a favorite one, but I fully agree with Nico's observations. And in that sense, I agree with Hugo. I think that the protocol that best adapts to the Internet Act architecture is DOT. DOT complies with all the design principles that respond to protocols in general. And I would say that this follows the same steps followed by all the other protocols that arose as plain text protocols and then started receiving encryption layers, DHTPS with first with SSL and then with TLS. So map, pop, STP, all those protocols followed this path. They began as plain text protocols when the need for encryption was not yet there. And then this was followed through security architecture, which in fact has been proven in itself. It is a security layer that has its own development and virtues hum somehow. And is continuously analyzed by the experts. Now, DOH, although used TDSS through HTTP, this somehow generates some kind of conflicts, in my opinion, because it makes a lot of noise, that mixture of things. What Hugo was saying is quite true. It's quite curious that a protocol that was designed supposedly with a promise of protecting privacy has an enormous chapter on risk for privacy that it can produce. So that's a bit curious. Now, having said that, I do have an observation, and this has to do with things that Christine commented on at the beginning. This, It is quite true that not all scenarios are equal, although some things respond to the historical development of the internet and have to do with the work that is done through the portal. It's quite true that DOH can be an interesting approximation. In other words, in environments where there are players that active, aggressively filter traffic, then it might be more interesting to have DOH as a tool. And let me make a comment here. Those who have heard about this might this might sound like a repetition. My main problem with DH is not the technology, but the approximation that was done from certain sectors, particularly one of the most concerning things about DOH was moving the DNS queries from the OS to the applications. Because in DOH, it's very easy, easy to do that. You have a programmed browser, and then you add the DNS query. That's very simple. But I think that is bad. And even from the standpoint of privacy, it has many negative issues. So the user no longer has a control about who does the DNS query. And above all, the user 
no longer has a trust relationship established with someone. And this is one of the things that Christine mentioned at the beginning. If you know who your resolver is, then you can assess the risk that that resolver might pose. Now, the 15, 20, 100 applications that I'm running on my mobile phone or my laptop, each does its DNS query the best they wishes to. That risk analysis becomes impossible to carry out. So if you were to ask me, that is one of my less favorite things, namely the trend to take the DNS resolution from the OS to the application. That is a very bad idea, I think. Now, it's not exactly the same, but this is also related with concentrating the queries in a small number of resolvers. In itself, this is also a risk for the privacy. Those are repositories of information become very interesting targets. Now, having said that, I'd like to refer to something that Nico mentioned, which is relevant. I don't know if it was Nico or Christine. So what are we protecting ourselves from? We are expecting the queries, but that's not the entire risk scenario of the DNS situation. But many queries are still in plain text. And one of the extremes is my local resolver that still sees my queries. And then in the other end, it's the authoritative extreme. It also sees the full query and in plain text because it have to have it in plain text in order to resolve it. So those two extremes need to be treated somehow in a way that is outside these protocols. And in some cases, it might not be a technical treatment, but it could be like an audit or explicit uh, privacy commitments. And finally, I'd like to refer to DNS over quick, which I think will be very useful as a community. And I think I spoke too much. Sorry, Nacho. Thank you, Carlos. Now, Christine has the floor. Let's listen to your opinion. I agree with everything that has been said in the comments. But one of the things that, for example, DOT has the spirit of internet somehow in a better way. There I can have all the servers doing the queries. So it's very ideal that all do DNSSEC encryption with the resolvers and having less interferences along the way. Although at corporate corporate level, there are some complexities, but these are not necessarily the environments of the end users. So each technology is developed thinking about certain threats. So I think that DOH was designed thinking about this scenario after Snowden, after the issues regarding sniffing or spionage. But they tried to make the TNS traffic as, here as a different DHCP traffic. Now, this is bad for several reasons. One starts having a traffic that is mixed with DHCP one starts having applications that start to decide who will be doing the queries, which somehow leads to losing control about who does the queries and where they are heading. There are more and more queries that show how certain act players take data without us even realizing this. So we don't really know what they're doing with these data. That's my major concern, because if you have the large browsers, which by default have a DOH, they will have data concentration. And this is not about earning money or doing marketing with that data. But these things end up being a target which is not of a country or a state. You also have organized crime. There will be interest in having someone, an insider that can provide data to third parties. This will be an enormous target. 
all this ends up bringing about a risk which is not so easy to handle. It's not just the risk of whether if a browser crashes and internet crashes, this is what people will perceive, namely that internet crashed. I will no longer have access, I cannot go back. So this is a point with DO, where DOH would be less favorite one, and the favorite one would be DOT. So it may be a solution, as long as we can choose. And as we said, in the uh, transport layer and not in uh, the app, uh, I can control it. As a user, I can control my privacy better. That would be my comment. That was very interesting. Very interesting answers, all of them. And it is clear that uh, we maintain uh, the objective. What is the objective for the development of certain standards and to meet what kind of threats to privacy? So going a bit uh, more technical, I have a question for Carlos. In terms of performance, do you consider that these protocols have a great impact in the resolution times? I, I estimate that it, depending on the protocol, it will have a different time, but uh, what do you think, Carlos? That's a very good question because that's, that's always a concern, especially in uh, network operators. And this is a question that we have tried to answer or to address since we were working with the DSS. DSS. When you put a TLS layer in the middle, you are adding a new negotiation of a protocol or uh, whatever. The, you have all the TLS negotiations until you ask the query. And that, I won't speak of TLS.3, uh, I'm going to speak of it later, but the TLS uh, that uh, that uh, we are using now that has an impact on the first query. Now, here, what saves us from here? The excellent and bright uh, design of the original DNS that already contemplates uh, those things uh, with all the cache, the cache um, system. DNS is so good with uh, cache that I think that the, the impact of those extra negotiations is less. Unless you are unfortunate and you have to query a registry or a zone that have with very small TLs or very small uh, lifespans, I think that the DNS uh, cache uh, solves any delays. So I don't think that from the performance point of view, the, the impact may be specifically remarkable in any of them. If on top of that, we add TLS.3 uh, in some scenarios, I think the impact is even lesser because uh, the negotiations of uh, uh, there is much more efficient. Now that's from the point of view of the performance perceived by the user. Now, if we consider perceived by the users, I think that it's, uh, you can manage it with the hardware that we use today, but it is true that it will be an additional burden on the servers that now will have to do cryptography per query. And in many cases, they will end up using TCP to answer the queries. So indeed, there may be some overburden and uh, cause uh, uh, deterioration of performance in the servers. Perfect, thank you, Carlos. That's interesting. And going back to the users, it is very clear that for most users, the uh, DNS is transparent and it will be difficult for, for them to, to know the configuration of the DNS that they are using in their connection. I remember that initially they talked a lot of DOH, of the configuration by default of the resolvers. I remember that at the beginning from Mozilla and Cloudflare, or that they were going to use some other. What risks do you see there? Already uh, putting ourselves in the shoes of the users. What risks do you see if somehow you force the use of DOH? 
in browsers. And Carlos already mentioned it a bit. If these resolvers are pre-configured in apps or in browsers. Christine, would you like to start? I think that there's a great risk, especially if uh, we don't state very clearly to the user if the first time that they open the browser, your browser will send all the queries to a server. Do you want to continue to use this browser? So it's, it's not a transparent option. They're always going to say that the option is there, that you can dis disconnect that by default, but it ends up being uh, being an option that only the experts in the area will understand uh, how to get there. So there, I think that the great risk is uh, to have such a concentration and uh, use and abuse of the data intentionally or not because they are centralized in one place. So let's remember that all the companies need to abide by the law of the places of the countries where the companies are incorporated. So there will be legal actions uh, or there will be um, obligations. For instance, criminals um, are going to be involved. We are always going to have someone involved. We are never going to know very well if the response that I got is the right one. You're always going to have the doubt because there's no option, or at least the users were not given another option. So I think that that's a key point that is very similar in all the discussions that we have in the NECBR and when they passed uh, the data protection law that it, that is informed consent. I know what informed consent uh, is for me. Or do, does everybody know it? Or do they just tell you, well, internet will be faster from now on and from now on. It's like selling VPNs that are not VPNs. They sell that idea that everything is more secure now, but be, without any information to people. So we end up in a monopoly that is bad. Mm -hmm in relation because uh, of the nature of monopolies. As a user, I'd like to have more privacy. We're losing privacy because I don't know whether I would like to have someone uh, ma making a, a advertising and because everything is, is connected, the marketing tools and the CDNs, so it's, it's very dangerous because there's a lot of power in the hands of very few institutions. I think that that's one of the issues that we have to think of. Nicolas, what do you think about it? Well, first of all, I think that even before we give the user the possibility of configuring these protocols or a configuration that comes by default or telling the user, well, we suggest this configuration, or if you don't want to do anything, it, this is the default configuration, but you can configure it manually. You can turn it off when you, you want it. I think that before that, I always like to understand to be in the side of the non-technical uh, or the, most users don't even want to learn about this. They just want to uh, not even use the internet because that's uh, too generic, but they want to know something. So the DNS, that is a translation of the name, the IP to a name, is the tip of the iceberg, the tip of the tip of the iceberg. So if I give users a configuration by default, it was already said by other people, and in general, por defecto sin posibilidad de opción por um, parte del usuario, nunca son buenas. That uh, if the users cannot change the configuration, it's never good, because there are always cases in which it ends up promoting concentration or promoting a single uh, failure. Uh, so as Christine said, well, putting everything together in one place, if we know that the operator is somebody that has a set of people that operates it and has the resources, but it's going to be a clear target for all the attackers. They are going to become uh, a target for um, extracting for phishing information. 
So, on the other hand, as I said, users don't want to know about this. That's my feeling. As a user, every time that I'm going to use a device, really, I'm not uh, considering this. And it goes without saying that we have many devices that cannot be configured as the Internet of Things appliances, the stove, the refrigerator. What you can configure manually is just a very, very small part. And that very, very small part, almost nobody, I'm, I'm saying something very big, but almost nobody configures anything manually. So when the time comes to tell the users, I give you this option that will be uh, you more secure, the DNS uh, queries with a recursive, and to say, well, it can, uh, it gives me more privacy. Yes, so I say yes. But if I don't know what the recursive uh, is, uh, I, I, if it has the, the word uh, um, privacy, then everybody is going to click. So the, we have to work with social engineering and uh, see what we give to users by default, even if it can be changed. And there's another thing that is a bit more technical, but I think it's accessible for to all users, is the DNS queries are the beginning of the whole thing in this case. So after I solve the DNS, it doesn't matter whether I have a DOH uh, or um, uh, even if it's acting in anywhere else, uh, any protocol that gives me privacy, then I have my browser or my device that has an access to that site using the IP address. I already saw the name. And when I use the IP there, there the traffic is not encrypted. So the whole thing of, well, if you encrypt the DNS queries, your operator won't be able to see part of your data where you want to go. No, it's not true because the operator can always inspect where the uh, IP is and to have access to the site where you are having access. So it is not true either that just by ensuring the DNS, you may ensure the privacy of the data. As a matter of fact, there's nothing further from truth. Of course, ensuring privacy to the DNS is a significant part. Now, the thing is, how can you give it correctly without making the user voluntarily or involuntarily fall into a problem? Very clear, Nico. Excellent. Hugo? Well, yes. Can you hear me? Yes, precisely. Um, what Nico said, I think that his uh, statements are perfect. The DNS will be uh, encrypted, whether we want it or not, because as Carlos said, starting with a web protocol, uh, it, and it's good for it like to be encrypted, but we have to do things well. It is true that in the internet, you have the freedom to innovate, and to create new protocols as you wish. And that's one of the good things about the internet. But there's a certain responsibility. And I would leave things, uh, things have to be discussed. It's no longer the time when you could invent a protocol and to launch it experimentally with people. And the internet has become a very important social tool. And I think that we are all at a time where uh, any change made, even when considered minimum, from a technical point of view, we can consider that they are minimum and that these things are going to solve uh, on their own. But I think that with the current status of the internet, everything has to be discussed with the different uh, stakeholders that are part of the internet, because each has different objectives, different goals. We can't think only of users. We have the internet providers, we have the governments, we have the law enforcement, the parents that wanted to take care of their children. And there's a company that makes a change and breaks with all this. So I think that it would not be a responsible thing. Uh, well, well, the DOH, how the DOH was launched, the people that launched it, is people that knew what they were doing. So you can always find strange things. And this has been discussed a lot. That is, this was sold as enhancing your privacy, 
but sending all your DNS uh, traffic to an American um, uh, uh, space. So this was all very strange. Now, if we go, could go a bit further to see the social causes, then I think that there was a lack of trust of many players that want very often i think that what we need is to have a more global vision of the world and how this works maybe in some places like in the united states they might be some bad guys that are intercepting traffic and monetizing this but this is not always the case in europe there are very strict rules people trust their isp very much more than an organization that is in a different country than their own so i think that i would view that from that standpoint another point is that when the doh issue began there were many people who started defending digital rights and defended that way of doing things precisely because this was sold as greater privacy but protecting you from the bad internet providers well that was one of way of doing so but this community of users that advocate for the defense of the citizens rights i would say that things are not that simple and you'd have to ask the experts and i also applaud this initiative that LACNIC has made of bringing people from different areas to speak about these issues because not everything is as wonderful as it seems like oscar said at the beginning there are some small technical changes that can be viewed as simple changes or have a clear objective and won't produce secondary effects but we have to discuss everything and work for something better as a whole thank you Hugo. very interesting carlos what's your standpoint well i agree with the opinion stated by the previous speakers i think that when there are behavioral patterns that have been established for a long time already and somehow involve implicit contracts between the user and the machine because the interface user machine is the weakest link in the chain of many technologies and of this technology too and might have to do with things that have nothing to do with the internet and the same thing applies with these issues so when someone introduces a change no matter how subtle in that interface user machine this has to be done very carefully and informing all the parties involved there are some tragic recent examples where this principle was violated and people ended up dead so i think that one of the things that more i felt most uncomfortable with was introducing new factors in that implicit contract between the user and the computer i think many more risks were introduced and those were resolved i agree with hugo that very often you celebrate victories without having fully understood what was done in fact and sometimes things are judged by the names instead of doh if we had called it super private dns it might have been even more successful so i think that we have the responsibility the general responsibility of informing i would say educating because i think people are educated what they need is information appropriate and actionable information on the tools that truly help them in achieving their objective thank you carlos <laughs> this is a lot of food for thought i must admit i have a question for Ugo. Hugo, you work in NIC Chile, you the country code domain name administrator CL.CL. How do you consider that CCTLDES should work on privacy 
Indianess. Thank you, Ignacio. That's a great question. Well, these protocols we have been discussing and where this DNS issue all stems from, this stems between the end user and the DNS recursive server. That is where the DOT, DOH, and DOQ are working. The CCTL does work at the other end of the communications, your own recursive ones and the authoritative ones. So we still haven't started working there, but this is something that will come in the future. Work is being done at IETF, and the idea is how to encrypt this part. It's more complex to do so because the space between the recursive one and the end user involves a space of trust. A recursive can respond to thousands of clients, and the, it is quite clear as to the portion of the network it is providing services to. In the case of the recursive one in Chile, like uh, CCTLD, they have to respond to everyone. An authoritative one cannot block just one part of the internet. So the scale is quite different. The challenges are also quite different. Of course, at NIC Chile, we'll be working on this. We'll organize laboratories and contribute as far as we can. This would be in the future, but at present, this is not something that is affecting us right now. Thank you, Uwa. This has to do with what Carlos was commenting on a while ago. So if you are encrypting everything, but not the ends, the extremes, it is in those extremes where work is now beginning. So very interesting that Nick Chile is really providing infrastructure for the purpose of analyzing this and working on this topic. There are some questions. I have three questions here. I won't ask the questions yet, but if anyone has any questions, there is an icon on the screen at the bottom in the Q&A. I have a final question for everyone before we go over to the questions from the participants. So somehow we assume, because initially we had assumed that these protocols contribute privacy to DNS after the stock this is no longer so clear whether they do provide privacy or not, from where and how. There are some interesting concepts that have to do with subjectivity and objectivity. So who is looking for what? Where do I think privacy lies and where not? Now, do you consider after this talk and from your standpoint, do you think that they comply, these protocols comply with privacy. We could start with Christine. Well, what I think is there is something that Carlos mentioned. If we had called the DOQ, we'd call it a different name, this would have been adopted by everyone, depending on the name, because privacy is a concept that hasn't been very well defined. So what we could say, if it protects confidentiality or if it protects integrity, depending on what we're going to do with encryption, because encryption does that precisely. It protects confidentiality, which is what these protocols do. So it could protect integrity, which is the main mission, of the DNSSEC, namely to sign the response and then give us this response. But having privacy protection between two ends, well, I'm not so sure if privacy is provided. It's very good for the purpose of publicity that it will provide privacy. But if what I wanted to do was to protect myself from the access provider from the government of my country, well, this would lead to another problem, which might end up in more serious privacy issues. For example, my data being sold to a company or my data being used for profiling and determine which have been my searches. 
because all data is important. So it would be too simplistic to think of it in that way. If we do a search in the internet on measurement conference 2019 or whatever, it's what I call DNS over encryption. This is an interesting document. It analyzes the weaknesses of each protocol, whether they meet the standards. And it sort of lands the discussion on whether this is encrypted or not. And we're not even speaking about authentication, because in that case, we should ensure that we are talking and if the resolver is providing the answer, then I have to be sure that that is the answer. So I'm not so sure whether I'm going in the direction I wish to, or if I'm doing in a direction that I don't wish to go, that is taking away my privacy. These are things that are very subtle. But I do agree that there are things that the user does not wish to know but the user does not wish to know in the way we are explaining this. In fact, that's the biggest problem. Users would like to know something and we should figure out a way of better explaining this to the user and clarify the risks. This is no easy task, but I don't think that privacy is delivered in such a way. It is far more complex in all this discussion. Nico, what is your opinion? Well, I do agree with what Christine has just stated, particularly with the fact that very often this is how you say things to the users. The user wishes to access a service. And it all depends on how you show this to the user, how you present the information to the user so that the user can understand the information without the intention of measuring, mentioning any providers, starting from the user and then the segment of the provider, whichever service. You have DNS issues, email issues, web browsing issues, and many protocols. But maybe the DNS is probably the one that is always used because everything starts from there. Now, the ones that are most used might be HTTP and HTTPS. In other words, web browsing and email and social media. Now, if I expect to explain something to the user and tell the user, well, this is the issue regarding privacy and with this protocol, you're going to solve the situation. This leads me to recall a quote by someone who said, you can lie just saying, just telling part of the truth. You can tell part of the truth, nevertheless, you're lying, not intentionally, because it would be impossible to explain to a user how internet works, how the networks operate, so they have a global vision. So you have to decide what part you explain to the user, and like Christine was saying, how you explain this to the user. That would be my first reflection, a mixture between what Christine was saying and what Hugo was saying. So this requires discussion, this requires a debate, and not just a technical debate. You have to have a discussion with people who understand this and how to present these things to the users so that they can understand this. And we are quite bad as, at explaining. We are wonderful when you explain things to the IT experts, but to one who is not an expert, well, that's not so easy. So if an IT guy is trying to explain something to someone who's not an expert, that would not be my first option, not saying that we're all bad at explaining. So that's my initial reflection. My second reflection, which is something that was not mentioned, and this has to do with something that Christine said, this issue about encryption is wonderful, nobody can read it, but there are scenarios that we did not mention here. And let me just mention this, because we'll be taking home a lot of questions. There are scenarios 
where encryption is not good, or at least not encryption, not encrypting and not knowing what is happening. For example, in a corporate environment, if I belong to an organization and I'm using my device, you know, this about bring your own device and using my mobile phone and connecting to the networks of the organization. So I'm browsing and I have the freedom of configuring my browser or my device in my organization, whichever way I wish. And I establish a protocol of like these. Now, imagine that my organization has a traffic inspection system, a intruder de detection system, attack mitigation, and so on. If I encrypt the DNS traffic, if my organization does not have the, the way of disencrypting this, they lose control. If I am attacked successfully and using the DNS channel to extract information, I will end up providing the attacker with an encrypted channel to obtain information on the company. In the end, the vulnerability, the exploit that generated uh, because you had that protocol is worse than the solution. So you need to see uh, the scenario, the setting. Not in all settings is this good. And finally, a comment on one of the questions that I'm sure you're going to ask later. Again, the protocols that we mentioned here, anonymization, DOHDT, DNSSEC was mentioned. DNSSEC is more in the side of security and not so much privacy, but it has to do. Those are complementary protocols. So if the takeaway message is it's not one or the other. You have to analyze all, they complement each other. There are some that definitely would be desirable, such as DNSSEC, in my view, and there are others like DOH or DOT, that it depends on the situation. I have to assess whether it's convenient or not to use it. Very clear, Nico, thank you. Hugo? Yes. Well, Nico already showed us but well, we can say that it's not that these protocols are more secure because they could help uh, obfuscate uh, things and the systems may alert without the systems alerting in the case of data leak where command and control is not more secure. It is more, uh, the integrity is better. That is the fact that we use uh, encryption we can uh, detect uh, things. And precisely this this week, there was a, a, a query by a, a, a provider that says that 20% uh, of the traffic goes through uh, DOT. Um, they found that it was good that all these, uh, they had good results with uh, the systems that alter the packets. They not because of, secu of security, but there are firewalls that change things, so they avoid the and they prevent the res the resolution to work well. So the fact that they say that they establish a clean path and the protocols work well, but privacy, I think that's the big issue. Privacy, in the way engineers think of it, that nobody can look at uh, your all your traffic well i think that the end users what the end users care is that uh, nobody will know where i'm browser and that is not what they um you get with the dot or the doh everybody uh, there's always somebody will know where you're browsing so i think that this uh, these protocols do not meet what we expected from the point of view of privacy thank you i don't have enough paper for all the questions so you'll have to bear with me later carlos conclusions i yes i agree with everything that was said and i but i'd like to introduce a topic that we didn't discuss we could have discussed it but I think that we can mention it now, and it is 
it's very good to encrypt for privacy, but to encrypt, we'll need to issue certificates. And to issue certificates, I have two problems. Oh, I have several problems, but especially two that are relevant. One is the operational complexity. And I think that nobody here is free from uh, having uh, had uh, a certificate that um, uh, lost uh, validity. We've all we've always gone through that, that the certificate expires and it's a risk because two things happen when a certificate uh, uh, gets, uh, is no longer forced because if the, uh, we are self, uh, we, we are um, attacking ourselves because of security, because then afterwards we have the case of Dishinota where the certificate was compromised. And in the end, I think that there's a family of risks related to the proper management of the certificates. The issue, the world of the certifying agencies is a complex world, and it's a world where unfortunately, trust is more diluted than you would think. That is, if you go to the browser and you open the list of who you trust, you're going to see that if you were asked, if you trust all those things, would you trust? I think that I would keep uh, just four or five of the 100 and something in Firefox. There are quite uh, strange things. And I, I suppose, I assume that the people of um, Mozilla uh, vetted those CAs, but uh, the certifying agencies, but that's a risk issue that should not be minimized. Now, the issue of those certificates, well, the certificate needs to have its own integrity. That is how you issue the certificate, what kind of key and what policies it was issued. It generates a, a family of things that need to be taken into account. And what leads me to increase the operational complexity. When you introduce complexity, you introduce uh, more risk and th those risks have to be analyzed. And something that Christine said and that Nico also repeated, and I think it's particularly relevant, it's that encryption of the communication in the channel is almost useless if I don't trust, if I'm not absolutely sure that I'm addressing the server that I want. And for instance, if I don't know whether the zone, whether the registries that I'm uh, uh, sending the queries are um, the ones that I want. So uh, zone does not su substitute, not replace DNSSEC, the two are necessary. And finally, to highlight something that Nico said, that is the issue of, in the end, the problem of ensuring it, data is not just a, a privacy issue. It has different components, one of which could be privacy, but I also have integrity, availability, and all those things that we have to see together as a set, because we cannot try to fix one and uh, to worsen the others. Well, precisely. So now I added another note at the end. Well, thank you all. Now let's see the questions by the audience. I have the first one here. Well, I, I repeat that if you want any questions, there's a Q&A box that you can use. Let's start with the first one. This one was asked in the chat. It says, on DNSSEC, do you see it as secure or is it more recommended to use uh, DOT or DOH with encryption. Who wants to answer that? Well, I can do that. Hugo, go ahead. Well, the two things. As Carlos just said, DNSSEC works in a different layer. So it's not the same as the en encrypted uh, uh, protocol. So DNSSEC needs to be done, whether you like it or not. And DNSSEC, as well, it was created, is to pre protect between the authoritative and uh, the resolvers. 
and that part is not encrypted. And if it were encrypted, it would still be useful to use DNSSEC because it works on the layer of the data. And encryption, is, there's another layer in the internet. So I think that you have to do both things. Thank you, Hugo. Omar Valencia. Uh, Nico had asked that. We have another question by Mario Colindres. It says, if DOH uh, works on port 443, is that a, an advantage or a disadvantage? Because it works, it operates on the rest of the HTTP connections. I can answer that if you wish. Go ahead, Carlos. I think that depending on the scenario, indeed, it may be an advantage or can maybe a big disadvantage because in this when in a scenario where you consider that you're connecting through a network that might be potentially adversarial if you are sending a query on a site that uh, the government your government doesn't like well the traffic that traffic may be filtered actively and the fact that it goes to the same port and the dns uh, queries go uh, there is uh, an advantage because it's difficult to infiltrate although there are some techniques for instance looking at the encapsulation you may infer that it's a dns query if it uh, goes it's addressed to 111 and that's the challenge of sending everything to the same place. But in my view, it's more difficult to filter it. Now, why can't it, can it be a big disadvantage? Well, precisely because it goes mixed with the rest of the traffic. So if you are in a more normal uh, setting with your, with your ISP or at your company, with the infrastructure provided by the company, the fact that the DNS traffic goes mixed with the rest of the traffic. If you have any problem, that problem will be very difficult to, to discover because the traffic is all mixed. In business and companies, you sometimes you should see the DNS queries because of uh, Nico said, there are reasons why you should, for instance, for compliance, you need to see what is being queried. So it, it depends. It always depends. Oscar Gonzalez says, I understand that using DOH ensures that a government cannot uh, court uh, internet through the traditional DNS. So implementing DOH is a good practice that not does not cause risk in privacy. What other configuration of uh, the DNS would be, would be good practice? Cristina or Nico? I don't know whether I understood really the question. Um, if you have the DOH, it is probable that uh, you may know the servers. So this is something that we already see today. There are several notes saying that even that China blocks the big DOH servers. And I see that Ultimately, there, there are several countries with governments that interfere with the DNS and with laws that allow it, that allow interference. In Brazil, that happens too. So there are domains that say one thing and then another, and ultimately nothing is easy. Nothing will prevent the governments from uh, blocking, but nothing will facilitate the possibility of blocking. There will always be a way of using um, uh, loopholes and DNS. I think that a good practice would be not to touch the DNS, because if not, you can change functionality features of other countries and interfere in zones. I don't think that having DOH is something that really pre can prevent the governments uh, from doing something. I, I think that Carlos handled that very well in his response. I don't think that that should be complemented. I think that it's 
too risky to say that something ensures uh, security or any other feature. If it's a good practice or not, I think that we have to analyze each circumstance in particular. And I would dare say that in general, especially in our region, I don't think it's necessary to reach so much. I don't think that we are in a scenario that where we need to ensure so many things. But remember the things that we are losing, that is the, co the compromises. And in the balance, when you balance things, I go back to my initial comment that I would like to see more a, a greater deployment of DOT. Nacho, yes, as to what Christine and Carlos said, I'd like to add that as, as they said, but I'd like to emphasize something, and it is when you speak of government block blockades, uh, maybe it's too obvious, but not, not necessarily for us. It's not governments who block, but it's the internet access providers. And it's a subtle difference because usually the governments el gobierno dicta cómo ejecutar ese bloqueo. Pero el gobierno va a decir, bueno, yo no quiero que los, eh, las personas que están, residen en, en nuestro país o que utilizan estos este, proveedores de acceso a Internet de, 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 de este determinado región o país este, puedan acceder a tal, a tal servicio de Internet. ¿sí? Eso es lo que ellos quieren. Después, ¿cómo se implementa eso? Puede haber muchas formas, desde utilizar el DNS para que no puedan resolverlo, que hoy en día cada vez va siendo una medida muy poco efectiva y muy poco recomendable, porque el, el daño, como decía Carlos y como decía Cristín, el daño colateral es cada vez más grande, digamos, ¿no? Porque atr atrás de un, de un sitio web, todos sabemos que puede haber más de una cosa, más de un servicio hosteado en el mismo sitio, entonces cuando yo impido el acceso a ese lugar, en realidad estoy impidiendo el acceso a todos los servicios que se dan desde ese mismo lugar, ¿no? Es decir, si yo filtro, no sé, hoy en día filtro Google, no solamente impido que puedan usar el correo electrónico, impido que puedan usar cualquier otro servicio de Google, YouTube, etcétera, ¿no? Este, lo mismo si, si impido que entren, no sé, a Amazon, que hay un montón de servicios que se hostean en, 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 servicio, en servidores de, de Amazon, o, o pasa lo mismo con cualquiera de estos grandes proveedores multiservicio en Internet. Entonces, eso es un tema, ¿no? Y, y, y el, otro, el otro énfasis es, eh, si yo realmente lo que quiero es este, saltear un tipo de bloqueo particular, es muy importante lo que decía Carlos, digamos, es decir, ok, yo esto lo voy a tener configurado por defecto, por si alguna vez en mi región, en mi país, mi gobierno decide bloquear, no. ¿Por qué? Por todo lo que hablamos, porque todo, todo esto, o sea, no, no existe el, 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 la solución mágica que resuelve todo, ¿no? Y que no tiene ninguna incidencia negativa, siempre hay. Un, un, un overhead, como decimos, siempre hay un agregado de información, un agregado de datos que hace que las cosas sean ínfimamente más lentas o no, pero siempre, siempre agrego procesamiento o agrego este tiempo de, 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 de intercambio de información, etc. Entonces, lo voy a hacer cuando tenga que hacerlo. Y si realmente tengo que hacerlo, si realmente me tengo que saltear una medida, bueno, tal vez lo mejor es generar un túnel encriptado contra un terminador de túneles en el que yo confío, porque volvemos a lo que decía Hugo, Cristín y Carlos, de que tengo que confiar en alguien en algún momento, porque es donde, donde en la otra punta donde sale mi tráfico al, al mundo, digamos, tengo que confiar en esa punta, ¿no? Y bueno, yo elijo un proveedor de, 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 de túneles, ahí sí, levanto un túnel y no solo mando el tráfico de ese por ahí, mando absolutamente todo el tráfico que sale de mi dispositivo por ahí. Y bueno, pero no lo hago tampoco en forma... Este, permanente, lo hago solo cuando tengo que hacerlo, cuando estoy en uno de esos lugares o cuando estoy frente a una, una situación concreta. Vamos a pausar un segundo el panel porque hay un problema con la, la interpretación. Ni bien me... Ay, sí, perdón, perdón. Sí, sí, ya está, perdón. Sí, sí, sí. Disculpas. Ya está, ya está, perdón. Vamos con una pregunta, la última que tengo por el momento. So this is my last question from Cesar Martinez from Paraguay. If we opt for privacy, don't we lose speed in the DNS resolution? Something was said already regarding this. 
Yes, I'd like to answer that question, Nacho. If you enable privacy using a resolver, I don't think this will be perceived because these protocols add encryption layers which can add more load on both ends. That's not that important, particularly there will be improvements from now onwards. But I might change my resolver with one of an external company, and this might have a big effect because the resolver is further away and it will make it slower and you cannot solve that somehow. But the ISPs have techniques that use a DNS which allow me to reach content that are in the networks of my provider in local caches. And this can be done transparently using the DNS and very rapidly. If you have a distant recursive one, this does not know the network of your internet provider, so your video can be very slow. It will be using the local caches. So that's far more important than just adding milliseconds of encryption or the channel. I have my notes here. So that was most interesting. The panel was good because this was like the De la objetividad versus la definition ¿no? de la privacidad, de la privacidad. of objectivity versus subjectivity. So, it depends on what I seek to protect or where. And this has to do with the diversity of these protocols. So, not all protocols try to find the same things in the same parts, simplifying technical issues. And Christine was saying that it's always important to know who my resolver is, because this implies who I am trusting and who is answering my queries. And then there are several protocols that could be involved, particularly DNSSEC, which provides the reliability that I expect as well. Then we have a point that has not been tackled by these protocols that we have mentioned, namely how the ends are treated. You always have text, plain text queries, and there we receive comments stating there are some initiatives that started to study these issues, but the protocols we were referring to cover the path, but not the extremes, the ends. And regarding the protocols as such, DOT, we heard that adapts to the internet structure and has followed the steps of other protocols that appear in plain text, and then they go through encryption layers. So this makes those far more uh, friendly with the internet we have. Regarding DOQ, this is not a protocol, but it could be interesting, something interesting to follow. And going back to the recent question on performance, Carlo is telling us about what users would perceive or not. And of course, if you add a negotiation layer, this has an impact, but this would be thanks to the DNS characteristics and the cache. This would be an impact in the initial query then on the DTL and the person we are consulting. This would have a greater or a lesser impact. Then with TLS 1.3, the impact will be far smaller because negotiation is much shorter. Regarding the servers, they will have an additional weight because they will require more time 
and with more resources in order to answer that query. Regarding default configurations, this was something that was discussed from the standpoint of DOT or DOH. Default configurations are not always good because they are somehow forcing something that I have not chosen. This is a proposed solution that is supposed to be universal, a universal solution, but is not always the case. So the operator can ultimately inspect and know where I stand and where I'm carrying out my query through the IP address. And of course, all the risks involved when having the default configuration of a browser. So only few user, users have sufficient knowledge in order to change this and select a different one. So there's a very big risk. And the main one is that of concentration. This might lead to abuse by the one who is doing the concentration. Christine was also, ref also referred to resiliency. So maybe that resolver does have a problem and then this would affect internet resiliency. Hugo is telling us that from nick.cl, the CCTLDs work on the conversation between the authoritative and the recursive DNSs. And the IETF is starting to work on these issues. So Nick Chile is also working on, this, working on these topics. Regarding the term privacy, this was quite interesting because right from the outset, we heard this concept, privacy, DNS privacy, maybe that wouldn't be the best term to use. Maybe we should use encryption because what we seek to have is confidentiality and integrity using these protocols. So what you achieve is not always privacy. Therefore, en DNS encryption, and from that encryption, we can also go over to integrity and confidentiality. In addition to that, we should have to figure out a way of explaining users these things. For example, if you have default configuration of a given resolver, if we're trying to have some specific kind of privacy in our queries, then it would be interesting if users understood this in order to determine what to choose and where to go. Nico was also telling us that there are some scenarios where encryption could be counterproductive. Because companies very often take care of their borders. And we don't have to view encryption protocols as, um, you, have to, you have to supplement these topics so privacy is sought at some given moment along the chain. So they might not opt for one or the other, but to supplement one protocol with the other. One does not replace the other. So if you have any corrections to these notes, what I made, please let me know. That's perfect, Nacho. Nacho, I'd like to add something just so that users don't take home a concept that is not complete. We have to know what users can do and what not regarding the protocols we mentioned, including DNSSEC, which is not a privacy protocol, but has to do with privacy, origin, authentication, and so on. This ends up having an incidence laterally on privacy or might end up doing so. DNSSEC, like you said in the notes, is between the resolver, the re Recursive one and the authoritative one, so the user cannot decide whether they use or do not use this, but the user can ask the provider, the operator of the recursive server, to support this and to do the DNSSEC validation. This is something that has to be done by the one and the other. Then the minimization, the user cannot decide whether they do that or not. This is something that is decided by the operator of the recursive server. The user can ask, 
the operator of the recursive server, I'd like to have this feature in the DNS I use. I'd like to have DNSSEC, I would like to have QNAME minimization act enabled. And then DOH or DOT, well, the provider of the recursive server will have to enable this because this is on the other end of the tunnel, but then the user can decide whether they use this or not. So this is just to have an idea of things that I can have an incidence on or not, but I can ask my provider to deploy these, and then I can decide whether I deploy these or not and how. Thank you, Nico. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for your explanation. Any comments? Any final comments? No, no, de mi parte no. I see there are no comments. Now, uh, I just want to thank the colleagues in the panel for their contributions and congratulate them because I think the discussion was very good. Thank you. Thank you again, everybody, for having participated because I think I speak for myself, but I, I hope that the 140 participants we had today have are going home with food for thought many lessons learned so i thank you again and see you next time thank you all for participating